You're listening to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast presented by Krauss Health, the exclusive healthcare partner of Syracuse Athletics. Well, welcome back to another edition of the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. And I'm really excited today because I've got a lot of things to ask our guest. Uh, It's Ken Pomeroy, uh, noted statistician, the the founder of the website KenPom.com. If you're a fan of Syracuse basketball, this is the place to be. If you're not going there, you should. I highly recommend it. I'm on that site every day throughout the basketball season. Uh, so, Ken, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mike. It's uh, great to be here. I've been a long time fan of your work. I think we've maybe crossed paths once or twice on the road. But, uh, yeah, it's nice to be able to have a more extended discussion here. Yeah, this will be great. And, you know, it. it I've always wanted to t- chat talk with you about, you know, the website and all the statistics and everything and how you come about, uh, you know, some of your ratings for everything. Um, But first I want to, well, first of all, I, I, I really reached out after your ratings for this season, the preseason came out just this past Sunday and everybody in college basketball, every writer was on Twitter or X these days talking about where everything was. And so that's my first question. Without a single game being played, how do you come up with ratings preseason wise? And is that probably like your least favorite day of the year? <laughs> Honestly, it's, I think it's one of my most favorite days of the year. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, once the season gets started and everybody, you know, there's all these ratings out there, they all tend to kind of converge on each other. But the preseason ratings are a little bit more of a fun challenge that you can look back on, you know, four months from now and see how you did. Uh, so I, uh, I enjoy it. Um, As far as how I come up with it, I mean, it's not really any different than how, you know, you come up with a, you know, ranking for the ACC teams or whatever, you know, it's, uh, I'm just trying to quantify those type of things. But, you know, looking back on previous seasons, kind of establishing like a baseline level for the, for a program based on how they played the last few years, uh, looking at what kind of players are returning, looking at what kind of transfers are coming in, looking at what kind of recruits are coming in, trying to quantify all those things. Uh, Coaching changes come into play as well. Uh, so all those go into the mix and, you know, out comes a rating and, um, you know, there's, uh, trust me, I, I look at the ratings when they come out and I'm always looking for the ones that I hate and there's a few, few in there that I hate, but for the most part, it's, it's, you know, pretty fun exercise. And, uh, I generally, I generally like the output. You know, it's interesting when we see the rankings, you know, the AP poll uses college basketball writers from across the country. That's opinion based largely. Yours is not. I mean, your opinion is not part of your rating system, correct? Yeah, yeah. My opinion is I do I do no manual intervention, other than uh, occasionally there are players that you know, like we're freshmen that come in that don't have a recruiting ranking that I kind of do a little research on and give my own personal <laughs> ranking. But other than that, it's you know, it's a completely automated process, and uh, I yeah, I don't do any manual intervention. So it is a little a little different. I also think like the AP voters tend to vote more on like upside you know like everything going perfectly for a team whereas my ratings are they're calibrated on past season so whatever happens during that season you know it's, it's going on that end of season rating so if a team had injuries or whatever like that's kind of like almost naturally baked into these forecasts like we're not assuming that you know the number one recruit's going to be a dominant force sometimes the number one recruits james wiseman and he doesn't play and so that you know that factors into it as well what I don't want you to give away your formula. That'd be asking Colonel Sanders to give me the secret recipe to the fried chicken, right? But what are some of like the the main things that you look at uh, that you that you do uh, put together in your ranking system? Yeah, I mean, you could ask me about the formula, and and I really couldn't even like explain it to you because it's not quite a formula. You know, it's more like an algorithm. Um, but it, uh, you know, I mean, those factors I, I mentioned are all they're they're they can be different for different teams um certainly like the you know the previous season's rating is probably the most important thing um you know it looks at five seasons worth of ratings but the most recent season is the most important um yeah and i would say you know then the you know i mean in the end it's program baseline and and what you have returning kind of internally on your team and what you have coming in externally like those are your three factors basically and, you know, again, like if you don't have much returning, but you have uh, a lot of transfers coming in, like that can 
boost your rating. I would say in general, like your rating is more boosted by returning everybody than bringing in transfers, but transfers can help. Um, but also it's like hard for a team that has played poorly the last few years to jump up in the rating simply from adding a bunch of transfers. Um, I mean, I mean, you can see that program baseline effect in like Florida Atlantic, you know, they end up at like 37th or 38th in my ratings and um, people are kind of surprised by that, but they, you know, they've never, they've had one season in their entire history in the top 100. So the computer leans on that pretty heavily and you no, know, it's not like an opinion based thing on my part to like put that in there. Like if you go back and try to like calibrate ratings for past seasons, like ultimately those are the things that jump out. Like, you, you know, program history is pretty important and a team that comes out of the blue and has a great season you know, it's tough for them to back that up, you know, two seasons in a row. So um, it's not like I'm, you know, intentionally coming up with a formula here to, that I think should work. It's like I'm looking back on past seasons and running the data and trying to figure out, you know, which variables are actually most important. Has the transfer portal, I'm like, how has that impacted you? Yeah, a lot. I, uh, when I first started doing this, you know, in 2011, I didn't have transfers were not a factor. It was simply pre previous, you know, few seasons of ratings and what you were returning. Uh, because, you know, there were still impact transfers back then, but, you know, it wasn't like a team would have four or five transfers coming in, you know, they'd have maybe one important transfer and most teams didn't have any. Um, so over time I've had to, you know, include that as a factor and try to figure out how to do that more intelligently as the years go by. Um, so it is a challenge, but I also would say it's a, cha like, it's a challenge for everyone. Like it's a challenge for people. Like part of the reason it seems like we've had this increase in, uh, you know, unpredictability or parity or whatever you want to call it in the last three or four years, I think is because of all the player movement. Like it's just, you don't, basketball is a game where context is so important and you take a player out of one context and put them in another context. It's really hard to predict what they're going to do, whether they're going to make a big jump or end up on the bench or whatever. It's, it's, it's much more challenging than predicting what a person within the program is going to do from year to year. You can usually assume most of the time they're going to improve, but you, you can't always assume that with transfers. Interesting. Okay. Syracuse based question for you. How do you handle a coaching change like the one Syracuse is going to be going through this year with, with Jim Beheim retiring after 47 years at the helm and Adrian Autry taking over? So coaching changes are generally like on average, they're negative and they're more, they have a more negative effect for, for better programs. So, you know, if you're the 300th ranked team and you have a coaching change, it's not that big a deal, but you know, if you're the 12th ranked team and have a coaching change, it's it's usually pretty disruptive and you usually underachieve the next year relative to the talent that you have on the squad. Um, so, you know, Syracuse is pretty far down the list. It, it is a small negative for them. I'd guess it's, you know, 10 to 15 spots or so that, that the, you know, it's how much that coaching change matters. And, you know, again, we're talking about an average here and you can certainly off the top of your head, I mean, I don't know how many coaching changes there were this year. There were, I think, a lot, like 60 or something. You know, there's going to be 10 programs out of there that make significant improvements. Like there, you know, we all can come up with cases where you get a new coach and there's instant improvement there's instant, you know, you go in a positive direction. Yeah, we're um, all expecting St. John's to be better with Rick Pitino. Exactly. Uh, great point. Yeah. So my system assumes, you know, a little bit worse with Rick Pitino, but kind of a false assumption. And I did play around with like including actual coaches like in the the ratings this year because there is an effect it's just really hard to implement so i just kind of stuck with um you know what i have but you're absolutely right like great example there you do expect rick Pitino to to make a jump and there'll be you know four or five other coaches that make a big jump this year and uh um, so it's just it's just a raw just a raw average very simple part of the equation a reminder to our viewers that uh we're here with ken pomeroy of kenpom.com and his four-legged assistant <laughs> <laughs> who, who do we have uh, trying to get a little camera time there, Ken? Yeah, he gets a little, it's uh, my buddy Cooper. He gets a little jealous when I'm doing interviews, but we will get plenty of attention later on. All dogs are welcome <laughs> on the podcast. So uh, this is, this is great. All right. So with this coaching change, you know, I was looking at what you had for Syracuse's adjusted tempo. And it's one of several things that you actually do include in the beginning of the year. Some of your categories are left blank. Uh, like strength of schedule and non-conference strength of schedule. But with tempo, you know, last year Syracuse was, I think, at the end of the year at 170th. And this year you have them started out at 167. Now, Adrian Autry's talking about playing more man-to-man, -man, not as much zone, and he wants to adjust the tempo, you know, go faster. 
But how do you how do you work that into it? Do you do you not believe in me? It's like you have to I have to wait and and see or what do you do? Right. So the the tempo model is a is a completely separate model, and that is ex well not exclusively, but almost exclusively coaching based. Okay. So uh, you know, if you know, if we're gonna mention Rick Pitino again, I don't know how much you want to do that, but you know, you look at St. John's, like Rick Pitino typically runs a faster paced style. So St. John's uh forecast of tempo this year is basically based on whatever Rick Pitino has done, you know, at, at Iona and at past stops. Mm -hmm. Um when you get a new coach, of course, you don't have any data. And so it does basically just look at the last season for that particular school and regress it heavily towards the average. Syracuse was pretty average last year anyway. So it just kind of keeps them um, basically right around average. Uh, maybe in the future, there's some way to, uh, you know, use AI or something to parse uh, coaches' press conferences. Although I don't, I don't know if you are familiar with my friend, Jordan Sperbo, who runs the, uh, the hoop vision account, but uh, of course, yeah, you know, like five years ago, I think he did a, a mashup of all the coaches who, you know, during their opening press conference talked about how they wanted to play fast, play a faster style or whatever, and actually uh, fact check those coaches after the season was over. And it was really like there was no correlation to how fast they played. Some of those coaches played really slow. Some of them did play fast. Some of them played average. So I, I'm pretty hesitant to uh, ascribe too much meaning to uh a coach, unless the coach says we're going to play slow. If he says we're going to play slow, they they probably mean it because that's not something. You, it's not something that's going to grab a lot of uh, positive headlines usually. It's certainly not a look, not a lot of, of recruits either. Recruits don't want to hear exactly. they're going to play slow, so no coach is going to say it out loud. Yes, for sure. Yep. <laughs> you know, how did you get started in this? Because I know your your background. Well, we'll get into the background, but you you went to Virginia Tech. And you majored in, I think it was atmospheric sciences. So how did you right. get started as you know into college basketball statistics at such a high level? Yeah, it was certainly an indirect path. I uh yeah, at Virginia Tech, I actually majored in civil engineering. Oh, and uh wow. so that's my first career. Uh didn't like that. And uh then I went to the University of Wyoming for grad school and majored in atmospheric science ah. and liked that more and and uh, actually worked as a meteorologist for you know, about a dozen years. And, and I really liked it. Um, it wasn't a case where I was unhappy and looking for a new career, but uh, I was doing basketball. I you know, kind of got started in that as a hobby. Uh, you know, Moneyball, I guess the book came out early 2000s. There was some writing about basketball analytics at that point, but not much. Mm -hmm. And so I just decided to jump in and mess around and do some stuff in my spare time. And eventually, you know, it because there was nobody else doing it, pretty captive audience. And I got noticed by, uh, you know, some writers, some coaches, and and things eventually took off over the years. And it just kind of, you know, through the natural course of events, allowed me to to do this uh, full time and embark on my third career and then actually ditch the, the meteorology. So instead of, you know, becoming the next Al Roker, you became the basketball version of Bill James. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was very much an off-camera meteorologist, worked for the government. So I, uh, there are some, there are some interviews on camera that I did, but they're in extremely small markets. And, uh, yeah, I was I was certainly uh, no Al Roker, that's for sure. <laughs> so, so you do you you were kind of like a sounds like you were a numbers based analytical statistical sort of guy, right? No where question. Did basketball come. Where, where did your love of basketball? Because there must be some love of the game. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, it's you know definitely uh, my favorite sport, and yeah, I don't know exactly where it came from. I mean, growing up, I was I liked kind of baseball and basketball equally just in terms of following the games i was terrible at baseball and i was okay at basketball for a couple of years like really young you know very insulated like competition um uh, but anyway that was that was the one sport that i really liked playing and so um you know i just kind of naturally started watching it you know growing up in the dc area you know it was kind of the intersection of uh you know the big east and the acc in their glory days so i mean you couldn't get much better in terms of college basketball and you couldn't get much worse in terms of pro basketball because the you know local team the bullets were just habitually terrible so it was like i just kind of gravitated towards college hoops thought it was you know a really fun sport and um yeah and that's kind of where the, the love of the game started and eventually you know matched it up with the uh the math part of it what's the biggest misconception about your your ratings at kenpom.com um usually it's that i'm trying to, you know I'm, I'm measuring like accomplishment or achievement and it sounds like weird or, or harsh maybe but i you know my ratings are not measuring 
the accomplishments of a team. They're trying to measure, you know, how good a team is right now. If they played today, how good would that team be? And you can't just look at at wins and losses to determine that. You know, you have to look at scoring margin to uh, kind of get the best estimate to figure that out. I mean, study after study has has shown that. It's not that winning is irrelevant, but scoring margin is just way more important if you want to predict future outcomes. And so sometimes a team will win, you know, 10 games in a row and they'll uh, drop four spots in my ratings and people will be like, well, this is a ridiculous rating system. And, you know, those are people who are, you know, conditioned to like the AP poll or some other poll where, you know, winning usually matters. Obviously for the NCAA tournament, like getting into the tournament, winning matters. Mm -hmm. Um, But for my system, winning doesn't really matter. It's more about who you play and, and how you play against them. And it's hard for every year. There's a new group of people that, discover my ratings and it's really hard for those people to kind of understand that concept because of that is is that kind of a reason an argument why your rating system should not be used by this ncaa selection committee yes <laughs> yes uh there's always kind of an awkward discussion because you know the committee does use it in the sense that the, the ratings show up on the team sheet i don't really know in practice how much they're actually used now with the net rate the net rating almost duplicates my my ratings first of all um but yeah, I mean, I think my ratings should not really be used for selection, except in maybe very specific circumstances, which I don't know if you want to get into or not. But um, but for the most part, yeah, my ratings should, you know, if, you, if you're trying to measure accomplishment, my ratings are not the way to do it. Let's just uh, establish that. You know, do you ever, especially preseason, does a rating come out? that makes you just kind of go, maybe I need to unplug the computer and plug it back in again. Cause like the one that jumped out to me was uh, Louisville. Louisville okay. ended the season last year at 290. And when your preseason ratings came out this year, they're at 109. That, you know, it's like a jump of 180 spots. Right. And so this gets back to the, you know, the history component of it where, I mean, that was a tremendous outlier for not just for Louisville basketball, but for, you know, any power conference program. Yes. So it's that kind of year. Yeah. You would expect some significant improvement from that. Now, whether it's 180 or 105 or whatever is, I guess, you know, in the details. Um, but yeah, that's, I didn't mind so much. Like there, I mean, okay. I feel like they will bounce back. It's, you know, it's, 105 is still remarkably bad for a Louisville team. You know, you look at their history. There aren't too many times they finished outside the top 100. So it's still, you know, not very optimistic about them, but it, it just seems impossible that they would come anywhere close to what they did last year. How much criticism do you get? And and where does it usually come from? Media, fans, coaches? Mm, I mean, I think in order, it's fans, media, coaches. Um, and you know, it's, it's kind of what I alluded to in our, from an earlier question where it's like, you get a new, like a new fan base that just suddenly their team has a good season and they don't understand my ratings. And, you know, that's where most of the criticism comes from. Um, and then the media is usually more educated about that, but there are still people in the media who again, are not familiar with my ratings and suddenly their team ends up pretty good. Like I think last year, the best example is Pitt, right? Like Pitt. You know, at, there there were times like I've been doing this long enough where I like I've had ratings that rated Pitt higher than you know any other AP voter or whatever back in the Jamie Dixon glory days. You know, they were my ratings love Pitt, but you know I was obviously less famous then. And so it's a new generation of Pitt fans that come along. And last year they have a good start to the season. They're really, or at least the ACC season. You know, at a time they're leading the ACC, and people are like, you know, why are they ranked you know seventy first in your ratings? Like. They're leading the ACC. Come on. They, you know, any team that leads the ACC should be higher than that. Yeah. And, you know, you, you look at their full body of work and, you know, a lot of their wins were kind of close and they had some bad losses in non-conference play or some close losses or close wins to not very good teams. And, you know, the ACC was, was this isn't the ACC of like 2004 or whatever, you know, so. Um, but you, you, you find yourself, you know, I've learned that you just really can't reason with those people and you just sort of have to let them wallow in their 
uh, misery, which is kind of an odd thing because they were having a great season. Like, why would you be miserable? Like, what what kind of like validation do you need for this season? You know, you're leaving. Yeah, you know, enjoy the, ride. the NCAA tournament. Yeah, exactly. Like, so, um, so yeah, and then coaches, you know, occasionally I do get hit up by coaches, uh, especially early in the year, because early in the year, you know, my preseason ratings play an important role still after, you know, five, 10 games and some team will get off to a hot start and the coach invariably will contact me and you know, this happened to me last year. Like, I'm not going to name the coach, but a coach contacted me and promised me they were way better than their rating was. And they were way better than this other team that they had just beat, that they were still ranked below. And you know, as it turned out by the end of the season, like they finished nowhere near that team. They're, they're way behind them and they, they had an all right season, but, um, but that's, those are typically the complaints I get from coaches, but they're pretty rare. Most of the time coaches, they'll call me or contact me and they will, it sounds like they're complaining and I'll kind of respond to them as if they're complaining. And then they'll be like, they'll be like, no, no, I'm not complaining. I just want to learn more about your system. But they're probably complaining, but they're doing it in a, at least a, a nicer way. Nice way. Uh, well, I know there was there was one time when you when you took uh, some heat. Uh, our worlds collided uh, back in February of 2020 uh, after a loss against Louisville. Jim Beheim, unprompted in his post game press conference, kind of slid into a little bit of a rant, and uh, you were brought into it. And I thought it was very interesting. <laughs> uh, he said, uh, "I don't know this guy." He's making a lot of money. Glad to hear that part, Ken, by the way. Right. Uh, Ken Palm. Uh, but when you start putting in print, they scored 25% against the zone against Buddy, referring to Buddy Beheim, and 25% against this guy. I'm telling you right now, no one in this room, nobody doing Ken Palm knows who's at fault when somebody scores on us. Um, the funny thing is, he was talking about a, another statistical-based website it wasn't you. <laughs> You're so famous, you get blamed for other people's sins. <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious. That was definitely a hilarious night. I uh, I remember it well. I don't. Yeah, I don't know how. I would love to know the chain of events or how I got connected to that. I mean, I remember the press conference, and he just it, the the question had nothing to do with that, and he just like he wanted to get that off his chest. And yeah, I don't know how I got brought into it. I don't know. I don't know why he cares about how much money I'm making. Like. <laughs> My understanding, Jim probably he probably makes a pretty good living as well. So, um, you know, whatever. But uh, yeah, it was um, it was it was hilarious. I mean, I, I actually, you know, the point he made was good too. Like, yeah, if somebody is trying to like assign credit or blame in his own defense, like it's pretty difficult. Uh, I generally like, even though I know Jim Beheim is probably like, if not anti analytics, he definitely doesn't care about analytics. Um, I generally find a lot of what he says like, you know, pretty interesting and grounded in truth so uh this was no different except that he somehow brought me into it when i obviously had nothing to do with it sure i get it and it wasn't uh, what your phone must have blown up that night yeah it was, it was pretty cool you know whenever you know i do get mentioned uh usually people will uh will let me know and uh it was you know i very very quickly was able to track down the video for that and uh yeah it was it was real i mean no joke it's like one of the one of the highlights of <laughs> of you know all my time in doing this is it was it was you know definitely hilarious there's no there's no other way to describe it again but before we finish up here it's 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 statistical data that you use your opinions generally taken out of this completely but when you put out your preseason ratings are you secretly are you are you maybe not secretly but are you hoping that at the end of the year your preseason ratings are close or is that even not even the goal preseason it, like your preseason ratings they're not an attempt to predict how things are going to finish at the end of the year or are they that's my right. question that was a terrible question no no it was not today. terrible at all it's a great question and uh so they're not designed to predict the ncaa tournament we should start there okay um, but yeah, it's a complicated answer. So they are, I mean, they are calibrated on end of season ratings. So theoretically, you'd think, yeah, they're designed to predict the end of the season. The real, the issue is that, I guess, there's actually not much difference between like how a team is at the end of the season and how they are at the beginning of the season. Like, obviously, some teams are an exception there. But I think if I could predict beginning of season, I would do that. Uh, I'm obviously, these ratings are going to make predictions at the beginning of the season. Like, that's the ratings are designed to make predictions for tomorrow. I mean, that's the most important thing that people care about is like, what's going to happen in the game tonight. So in that sense, the purpose is to use them for the next game. 
And I have looked at ways to like try to calibrate the ratings to the beginning of the season. Um, uh, and without getting too nerdy, like all the ways I've tried doing that have basically told me that there just isn't that much difference between beginning of season quality of the team and end of season. There are obviously exceptions. Teams develop. Almost all these teams are getting better during the season. But relative to each other, it's really hard to detect that, you know, Team A was the 30th best team in November and they're the third best team, you know, in April. Like, it's really hard to find that. So it's just a it's just a simplification that I'm calibrating these ratings on the end of the season. Um, but theoretically, they should work just in that they should work just as well for the purpose of predicting at the beginning of the season as well. That was a worse answer than the question, by the way. I mean, hopefully I, I disagree. Somebody understood it. I find this stuff fascinating. Fascinating. And I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. It's Ken Pomeroy of KenPom.com. Again, for college basketball fans, I highly recommend you go to the website, subscribe to it. We have barely even hit the tip of the iceberg here with this conversation. There is so much information uh, on this website. You can just delve into it both in terms of national ratings on stuff, but also just for individual teams. I know over the past few years, I've used it nonstop in terms of uh, Syracuse's defensive rebounding percentages and all this, all that stuff like that. And three point percentage defense. I love it. It's great. And I'm not even a, a, a real, I can't, I wouldn't even call myself a statistical maven or, or any of that, any of that stuff, but you put it in a way that I can understand it. And I appreciate it. Ken, thank you for what you do. And also thank you for joining us here on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me on, Mike. I enjoyed it. And uh, good luck to the Orange this season. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and hopefully our worlds do not collide at any point during the year. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thanks, Ken. It was great talking to you. All right. Thanks, Mike. All right. Bye now. See ya.